Okay, it's the top of the hour. So I think we'll get started. Um, my, my name is Sasha Grobenstetter and I am an educator with the University of Illinois Extension. And I'd like to welcome you all to the Autumn Picks Health Series. So this series is a collaboration between the Illinois Extension and the Interdisciplinary Health Sciences Institute at the University of Illinois, and is designed to connect those across state with researchers at the university and provide evidence-based educational programming. Um, we have a few housekeeping items before we begin. I'm going to have Emily launch the poll, if she doesn't mind. And this poll is to collect some basic information from our participants. Um, once you enter the information, feel free to minimize it off of your screen. So Emily, if you wouldn't mind, great. Thank you so much. Um, if you are seeking CEUs or CPDUs, please click on this link, which I'm going to put in the chat just now. Um, and following today's webinar, um, and you'll be receiving a follow-up email with an evaluation that needs to be filled out to finalize your CEUs or CPDU process. So let me put this link in the chat. Oh, I think Emily already did too, but thank you so much. Um, and for those of you calling in who'd like CEUs or CPDUs, you can go to a web browser and type in go.illinois.edu slash credits. Uh, and just another quick housekeeping, if you have any questions during the program, please type them in the chat box. And if you're calling in, please hold your questions until the end of the session. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Jonathan Serna, and Jonathan's going to tell you a little bit about himself. So Jonathan, take it away. All right. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, really appreciate your attendance. I think you're going to find this talk really interesting. Uh, if you attended my last presentation, you'll see how it dovetails with that presentation, and it dovetails into the series itself. Obviously, it has um, a specific order because of it. But it's about healthy habits and building a budget-friendly meals. Um, and we're going to obviously talk about tracking your progress. But I'm just going to introduce myself really quickly for those that have not heard about me before. I'm from Panama City, Panama. I was raised there. Um, and I have a background in dietetics. I'm currently a nutritional science student and also a dietetic internship. I'm completing my dietetic internship to uh, be a registered dietitian. And my general area of study right now for my master's and for my undergraduate work uh, has been nutritional and neuroscience. And my major interests include uh, cognitive function, how they interact uh, with nutrition, how nutrition, exercise, and um, cognitive training or mindfulness, how all those modalities interact. And ideally, I would like my uh, PhD uh, thesis dissertation to be focused on mindfulness and meditation. And uh, pertaining to this presentation itself, uh, behavior change. So just some quick information about myself. And uh, I want to start this by asking a quick question um, for you to interact with me a little bit. Um, it's not really a tricky question, but I just want to know if you think, like, do you, do you have to spend a lot of money in order to eat healthier? So if you could put your answers in the chat box, I'm just going to give it maybe a minute so that you can take your time doing that. But I would like to know if you think you have to spend a lot of money in order to eat healthier. So I'm looking at the, nope, no, nope, it depends. No, nope. yes, if you buy organic, I like that. <laughs> Not necessarily, yes. Okay, so we're getting some no, some yes. That seems to be some, somewhat mixed. No, I like this, I like this. Okay, that's great. Okay, let's leave it there because we're gonna talk about this in general. So that's pretty good. So it's a mixed answers. Uh, but first, let's just talk about what we're going to talk about in this presentation, because we're going to address uh, the connection between habit formation, as I mentioned um, in the slide before, but before about me, I'm really interested in the connection between habit formation and any given habit, and that includes obviously building uh, budget-friendly meals. And we're going to also understand key differences in food processing and their implications for, for health, because this is something that often gets brought up when having to build a budget-friendly meal like so canned versus frozen versus fresh these kinds of things we're also going to address myths surrounding healthy eating uh, just a few but they're important in order to, for us to understand uh, things that could derail us in our journey to again be a healthy human being in general uh, and then we're going to talk about how to use these habitual patterns how to build them up so that we can build uh, budget-friendly meals, um, and we're gonna use technology to do this. So this is not a perfect order. This is not like we're gonna go one, two, three. It's going to be integrated throughout the entirety of the presentation. So let's just start talking about 
how, what, what does habit formation have to do with budgeting? So one of the things that you'll find yourself saying is that you're this uh, person that, you know, you have a family, you yourself are trying to build these new habits. And let's say that your goal is to just, you know, have a healthful, healthier diet. And what happens along the way is that you find these obstacles that impede your progress. So you find your friends might not help you, or I don't know, you, you find that the grocery store is kind of far, or you find uh, that your budget is limited, or, well, we'll talk about that later, but just any given obstacle that you find along the way, and then you solve those problems, you know? But then always, you always find this huge roadblocks on your way to your goal, which are gonna have to do a lot with behavior change and with the, the budget that you can use in order to uh, build a healthier diet. So I specifically wanted to start here because if you notice how this gets talked about very regularly, it's sort of like, well, this impedes my progress and it's getting in the way and I have to just move it apart. And I wanna suggest that there, there is a better way to look at this because it's not like you eliminate this behavioral component. It's not like you eliminate the need for you to have to use money in a better way. It's better if you think about it more like this are, this is the Venn diagram. These are all the things that I will need to learn how to incorporate. And you won't eliminate them at any point. You will learn how to use them better and they will literally carry you to your goal. So you will learn how to implement things that impede your progress that have to do with things that you habitually do to spend money better or worse, things that you do when you're shopping that make you shop and get things that you need, either better or worse, to prepare and to budget. So we're gonna be talking about those things specifically, but I wanna offer this reframing of the way that this gets talked about because it totally changes how you address um, the upcoming uh, supposed roadblocks. So I wanted to start by talking about processing and the change that has, that has been uh, happening across basically centuries, because we know that unprocessed food was the, our go-to, our only option at the beginning. Like 1.5 million years ago, we were hunter-gatherers and that's all we could get. And then we started being able to get uh, a higher and higher ability to process our food. So we went through, you know, we started adding uh, cooking and drying and salting and smoking in order to preserve our food. Then 10,000 years ago, we, we had the agricultural revolution. And then we were able to um, get more and more and more skills in order to process and preserve our food. 19th century, we got canning of milk. 20th century, we, had we got dehydration, freezing. We got ultra high temperatures, uh, vacuum sealing, et cetera. And now we're closer to the 21st century. And you can see that, I mean, we have any of, our, of the means available to process our food and to preserve it. And this, this is actually very helpful in many ways. It, it helps with um, supply chains and globalizing um, food availability. We know that there are limitations to how that gets done. And we know that the food doesn't get to everyone. That's a huge limitation of these. But the processing itself, I know it gets often mentioned and talked about as um, a thing that will be inevitably bad for our health. But as we're going to see, that's not necessarily the case. Another thing that often gets missed with the processing aspect of the equation regarding food is that people think that when you buy things from, for example, uh, a canned, for just the, for example, the, the, the grocery store and um, they are more processed. So they are like massively produced and they have these things that now make them unhealthy or whatever. But I wanna propose that either at home or uh, in the production of agriculture and through the supply chain, you're gonna get really similar techniques. So if you're home and you wanna, I don't know, you wanna harvest, you wanna garden, you wanna fish, you wanna hunt, or you do that through the massive agricultural practices, you're gonna get pretty similar techniques at the processing level. So it's not like at home, you heat and clean and peel and cool and freeze. And then in the, uh, massive supply chain and the industrial agriculture side of things, you're gonna do something completely different. Like now we use this robots that have this, nothing to do with this, uh, what people call the natural process of uh, processing our food. But 
they actually involve very, very, very similar techniques. And I want to propose that if you were to preserve your meat at home, you want to make some um, turkey, jerky, or whatever it's called, and you want to, or versus comparing it to how the industry would do it, you would start adding salt. You would start adding some of the similar preservatives that would be needed in order for that to be preserved over time. See, at the end of the day, you're using very, very similar techniques. This helps to not demonize the uh, the the tools that are used in the in industrial agriculture, because you'll see that at the end of the day, they might not make as much of a difference as you think. So one thing that we already know from um, massive surveys that are conducted is that we are already consuming high percentages of canned, frozen, and dried um, food items. So especially for certain nutrients that we need to consume, for example, from vitamin E, you can see uh, the green here is canned. We get a lot of our vitamin C from canned goods. We get a lot of our vitamin E from canned goods, so on and so forth with sodium and potassium. So either you get them from one source or another, uh, sometimes gets talked about a lot, but at the end of the day, you are getting your needs already, well, at least many people from canned goods. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. To the right, we can see a graph of the percentage of needs that would not be met if there's um, this added nutrients to canned goods and dry goods and frozen goods. Uh, if those were to not be there, we would have a huge gap in many nutrients um, for essentially our, our needs. So we can see the huge gap we would have for folate and for thiamine and so on and so forth with other um, vitamins and minerals. But of course, at the end of the day, we wanna know what, what should we do with this information? Should we not then uh, eat fresh food? Should we, how should we incorporate this? So we wanna think about a, a very easy way to conceptualize this would be a bullseye. Yes, of course, we many times want to use fresh food. And when we shop, we want to go for that option if that is uh, available. But don't think that getting farther, farther away from the bullseye is not going to get you any, any of your needs. You can compromise and try to, get, try to hit the bullseye as much as possible and get fresh food. But the farther away you go, that is going to be more processed. So here you would have uh, food that is processed to help preserve and enhance its nutrients and freshness. Um, and then farther and farther away, you would get more and more processed food. But if you think about it, fresh food, although um, yes, it is minimally processed, is not necessarily the farthest away from ready to eat food. As you might have noticed, sometimes you buy um, products that when you look at their list of ingredients, it's really, really short, but they're ready to eat food. The price might be sometimes a little higher. So you will have to evaluate those things, but getting closer to the bull site will not necessarily get you farther away from meeting your nutrient needs. It's more of a simplistic equation that might get you closer to your needs. So this is sort of an algorithm that you can use whenever thinking about this um, from the, in the spectrum of less to more processed. And we want to definitely understand if, or just evaluate from the available evidence, if we will always get, for a fact, more fresh, uh, more uh, vitamins from fresh as opposed to canned and frozen and what gets often taught as the more processed options. But a, a, a paper published in 2017, the Journal of Food and Composition Analysis, um, assured us that this is not the case. With vitamin C, beta carotene, and folate, uh, we can see that for green beans and for spinach, we get a significant difference, but not exactly in the direction that we would think. Sure, in spinach, fresh, which is the blue here, was the highest in terms of vitamin C. Oops, this sped through me, but I was talking about vitamin C. Uh, vitamin C. Uh, for spinach, sure, um, it's gonna be the highest in fresh and it goes down subsequently, but first of all, it's not like you get absolutely nothing with frozen. You still need at least some amount of vitamin C for your requirements. And what's most important, for almost all the categories, you have no significant differences in their content. So these um, bars here are not showing the error 
that or the variability that you're going to see in the nutrients. But actually, when we say that there's no difference between this one and this one, it just means that if you were to look, put some bars here saying like this goes from here to here, this one's this one from here to here, it would actually not matter. They would overlap enough for us to say that there's no difference. And this holds for vitamin C, for better carotene, for folate, and for other nutrients that were investigated in this publication. So it's important to keep in mind that no, you're not always going to get more nutrients based on uh, more fresh food. And for example, here in the case of green beans, you can get more vitamin C uh, if you were to buy the frozen option for whatever reason. I'm not a food scientist, so I don't know the exact reason why this was, but um, empirically we can, we can uh, confidently say that we did find more of uh, vitamin C in the frozen green beans. And now I just want to talk a little bit about the spelling me uh, myths. Um, this is uh, a current one, I would say, uh, talking about plant-based being always cheaper. To the left, I just want to orient you to some options uh, for plant-based that you're going to find in, uh, for example, Burger King or McDonald's or White Castle, or White Castle and their meat-based counterparts. And we can clearly say that no, it's not always the cheapest option. Sometimes it's either the same but most times it's slightly more expensive. And it's not exactly more nutritious, at least at the macro level. We can see that they have very similar calories or they have sometimes slightly more. In terms of things that we might want to watch for, for example, sodium, oh my God, this is speeding through me. Um, something like sodium, we might, which uh, we might sometimes wanna watch for, sometimes the plant-based option is gonna be slightly higher. So no. Um, eating plant-based is not necessarily always better, um, not only for a budget, but also nutritionally. But I don't want to mistakenly say that then this is always the equation that you should use in order to evaluate if eating, for example, plant-based uh, is or is good or bad for you. It's uh, slightly better, slightly worse, depending on your goals. Because to be completely honest, plant-based options can be very beneficial to including your diet. So if you were to spend a pound of black beans, a pound of brown rice, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you would get, for this list at least, a total cost of $5. And from this, you can get, you know, uh, chili. You can get some mashed potatoes with a black bean burger that has some cel sautéed celery and green onions with some lemon in it. So you can get many options from this $5. So no, it's, it's a little bit more nuanced than just saying, like, if you were to try and get uh, plant-based options, it's always going to be better or worse. And no, you cannot say that, um, at least monetarily speaking, it is always um, not the best case scenario. Sometimes it is the best case scenario to include just plant-based options depending on your needs and your preferences. So it's very nuanced, but I just wanted to express that this is really a myth that is always going to be the cheaper option or the best option, nutritionally speaking. It's not always the case, but it can be the case that is better. And regarding eating healthy being more expensive. I know that I asked this at the beginning and I really wanted to just dispel this really quickly. I literally just, I, it doesn't matter where I search, what options um, I have for whatever needs I need to meet, there is an option. It doesn't matter where I look. I can look in the literature. I can look just a plain Google search. Obviously I encourage everyone to be careful with how you evaluate that, but you will find an option for anything you need. If you have a really tight budget, just say like, meals below $1, meals above $1. Um, eat, let's say that your limitation is that you don't know how to navigate the grocery shop, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about later, but it doesn't matter what limitations you currently have. There is a reliable source. Um, for example, there is a dietitian, there is an MPH or an RD, uh, both degrees, sorry, um, that has written about this that you can go look for um, in the internet um, or somewhere else and um, look for that thing that you need and start from there. So it's just a myth that um, it's inevitably expensive and there is no other way, that's just untrue. And now going back to what do we do with this information? Um, basically you need to plan. This is just a quote by Benjamin Franklin up here saying that if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail because this, um, habitual thing that we do. Here I'm just illustrating um, a book that is pretty, pretty popular from Charles Duhigg, The Power of Habit, talking about the cue, routine, reward that we 
inevitably engage in for almost everything. And this includes um, planning for budget-friendly meals. If we have this urge of planning for our next week's meal, we have the cue that, okay, it's time, you know? So we engage in a routine of planning either worse or better um, for what our week is gonna look like, then we can get our reward, which is gonna be either partial or um, complete in terms of how satisfied we are with our, our goals. So what I wanna uh, say is that it often is the case that we accomplish our goals partially, half hazardly, and just basically suboptimally because we get some meals done, we throw the rest away. We get some meals planned, but then we don't eat some of them or um, they get they, they rot in the, in, the, in the fridge because we just don't like the amount of variety that we plan for. So it is the case that many times this bad planning becomes habitual. So what we want to do obviously is to start replacing those poor planning, poor spending, unsuccessful cooking um, tools that we're using with their opposites. We obviously want to plan better, spend better, and use better cooking techniques so that we can fit um, our needs to our tools or our tools to our needs, I should say. And based on that, obviously results were ensued. But I wanna talk about this concretely. So I just wanna offer a case study. Um, I don't know how this is gonna sound to all of you, but um, this, this is uh, anecdotally true um, that you know, you're gonna have a busy family, let's call them the busy buddies. And there's two parents in this family. They're really busy with work. And there's two kids that um, are at school and they have many extracurricular commitments. So they're really, really busy in general. And they have a really low budget to accomplish their nutritional goals. You know, their cooking time is limited. Their needs are at least obvious to at least their parents. They, they need food variety because they're going to get bored if they just eat the same thing the entire week. And they have to meet, obviously, their caloric, their caloric and nutritional needs, not only of themselves, but of their kids. So they, they really want two breakfast options, at least two lunch options, two for everything, basically, dinner, dessert, and per person, obviously. So what do they do? They plan for it. They use technology, as I was talking at the beginning, and they, they, they use uh, their phone. They're, they have their phones available, and they know that they have apps um, that have um, many recipes that they can um, connect to. And they know that this is connected, let's say to their grocery planning app. Let's say that they use, um, I don't know, Meyer or Walmart or whatever your the local grocery might be. And they have two to three hours to cook maximum, let's say on a Saturday or Sunday. And they, don't, they just basically don't have a lot of time. And they plan to use bulk cooking methods, which I'll talk about later. It just means that they are going to use methods that are gonna yield a lot of result for um, a little bit of time. So what was the result? They, whoops, they picked up their groceries in 30 minutes. They decided to do, go for that option. They just put their things online and picked them up with their car. They cooked, chopped, baked, roasted, peeled, did all the things that we talked about before in order to better um, process their food and preserve it better for the week. And they spent about 150, I don't know how realistic this sounds to you, but this is a possible thing. They spent about 150 per meal per person and they spent about $65 total for food. So I don't know how unrealistic this might sound to you, but we will go through specifically how you could accomplish this. So I don't want these to sound like magical thinking. You can do this. It's just a matter of having the right tools. Yeah, so I was just trying to say how. But uh, obviously just first, what, what is it that I was talking about? What is this uh, bad habitual thing that gets incorporated into our budget-friendly planning that goes wrong? Well, one of the things that, um, goes wrong a little time is that you eat out when you have food at home. Why that is, there are many, many reasons why that happens. You don't like the food you made, you didn't um, have enough variety in your food selection, et cetera. There are many options why this might be, but we know that um, in America, we eat out a lot. Another thing that happens a lot, that doesn't happen with just with food, but you can see it with food very clearly, is that we, show, we shop impulsively. Um, this happens because, for example, we are hungry and then we decide to look at the grocery store because we have to plan for our grocery list for next week. Or we go to the store itself and then we buy compulsively. We didn't have this item on our list, but we just felt that we had to reach for this uh, candy or the unnecessary hummus. It can really range from what you pick up from the store, but people just do so compulsively. 
another thing that happens very often is buying duplicates. I forgot what I had at home, or you know, you don't, you're not having a plan for the grocery store or the, the, the kitchen. So you go to the grocery store, and again, this happens. You you just start shopping compulsively for whatever it is that you wanted to buy that's not on your list, it's not on your budget. Um, or in the kitchen itself, you just didn't plan for it. So now you're using this uh, cooking technique that is yielding, it's going really slow. You didn't know it was really slow. You didn't really plan for it really well. So it's not going as you expected, obviously. So how do we address this? So step one would be obviously determining what you need. So let's say that we divide this into planning phase and action phase. Let's say that for the planning phase to make this very concrete, you have 30, 45 minutes. You have a short cooking time. This is what you want. You want to spend a short amount of, uh, of time cooking. It's not necessarily the case that people might want to spend some more time cooking and that might not be a problem. But let's say for the sake of uh, time limitations, you might have a short amount of time to cook. Nutritionally, obviously, you want this to be nutrient dense, and it may or may not want uh, you might may or may not want this to be calorie dense. So, if uh, you're one of those people that have a short lunch and you need to have some calories, some nutrient a nutrient dense meal, and some carrots with hummus and a peanut butter sandwich does it, then that's the case. And obviously, we want to have variety in our in the flavor and the taste of our food because boredom is a real thing in terms of food, and it can cause some trouble um, along the road. Obviously, as we're talking about budget-friendly meals, we want this to be low cost. So if we were to say, you know, 150 to 250 uh, per meal, like the busy buddies or whatever, and you wanted to spend a total of $35 um, total on groceries per week, let's say you're just one person in this case, um, that is a feasible thing. But this is our, this is the plan. You just need to put something down in terms of what you're gonna do. So you have the time, nutrient-wise what you need and cost what you need. So what are you gonna do about that? Let's say that you need to put an actionable plan that also takes you some 30 to 45 minutes. This might seem long, but over the long, over the long haul, you're gonna save yourself a lot of trouble. This would include something like choosing a source for your needs, nutritionally and uh, time-wise even. So using it, an app, a website, or a, a phone-based app like Tasty or Fitman Cook, which gives you not only variety, but a source of, uh, variety in terms of nutrient and calories, as well as uh, cost. All these things are available for you to consider whenever you have this kinds of apps like Tasty or Fitman Cook. And you might wanna definitely choose something for where to get the groceries from, where are you gonna um, get this budget-friendly meals. Let's say, as I mentioned before, like the Walmart app or the Meyer app, those are um, both options for you to plan. If not, obviously the classic grocery list is uh, completely okay and choosing this just keeps skipping on me. Sorry about that. So as I, as I mentioned before, the source for your needs doesn't need to be an app. It could just be um, you writing down a list of things that you absolutely need in terms of uh, taste and nutrition and variety. You, you want, as I mentioned before, two uh, savory meals, two uh, sweet meals. So this could be uh, done in very many different ways. But I want to incorporate technology because we're not cavemen anymore. We have a lot of resources in terms of technology. And I think it's really important that we incorporate it to make our, our lives easier. So determining, um, so getting what you need, obviously at home, as I mentioned before, you wanna prepare yourself. You wanna double check for those duplicates, which uh, I talked about before. I'm definitely at fault for doing this many times. I go to the grocery store and didn't double check for something, I buy again. And there goes my, I don't know, $2 on whatever it is that I need to buy. And preparing that list or preparing that um, pickup um, if you were to use that one of those apps and, and ask for the pickup is really, really important to do in terms of a preparation phase. Um, for the grocery store, you, I mean, if you chose a pickup, you wanna go and pick up your groceries or you wanna prepare yourself for what it is gonna be like to do some in-store grocery shopping. But I wanna explore this a little bit more because this can get a little complicated. So if we were to pick up our groceries uh, one of the main reasons why I encourage this is because you have more time to consider what you need. Uh, this happens to me, actually, uh, a good example would be, I, I try to just order my Jimmy John's in person. And for whatever reason, I don't know if it's the spur of the moment, I forget my, I forget that I want no mayo. I forget I want a uh, whole wheat, whatever. I just forget. So if I just had a little bit more time to do it, like the app of Jimmy John's, um, I would have more time to get it correct which I do nowadays, and I do, in fact, get it correct more times than not. So I encourage people to do this more often because you really do have more time to consider what you're gonna need. 
you have more time to double check. You might be at home and you can literally just open your pantry or whatever. And then you determine, yes, I do have this. I do not have this. And there's a lower likelihood of, of you know, reaching for the hummus because the hummus <laughs> is not there. So it's pretty clear cut. But if you're gonna, if that's not an option, if you just don't prefer that, if you wanna go in store, um, then you just have to be ready. This is not a perfect, oh my goodness, sorry. Anyways, that's what I was saying. This is not a perfect equation, but it is a pretty good one. Um, the outer aisles where the fresh food, if that is an option for you to consider, uh, first is where you wanna go first. And then you might consider the center aisles. Again, this is not a perfect equation because there's nothing wrong with going through the center aisles uh, first. As long as you have your list, as I mentioned down here, which is essential, you can go through the center aisles. Again, it's just a simplistic way of uh, making your life perhaps a little easier. But yes, a list is essential because if you're gonna go through the center aisles, you can get distracted with so, there's so many options when going through the center aisles and you can just get distracted. So getting specific is, is another good thing uh, for you to consider because uh, as you're going through the center aisles, you might see just a ton of options. But if you know you want X, Y, or Z barbecue brand, just go in there, have your list, have the brand ideally that um, you need, or if you have it in your head already, you don't need to write it down, that's completely okay. Just have a plan and have a list. But um, I just wanna insert a caveat here because when you go and use this equation, uh, the deli section is gonna be around the corner when you go through the outer aisles and that's not always the best option. Again, it's not the worst option, it's not a bad option. It's, you just have to be careful because the deli section might be really rich in things that you might want to watch for. So um, there's gonna be really, really processed meats in that section which have really high sodium content. So none of these are necessarily bad but you might wanna be watching for the, one of these things. So just be careful with that. And again, you, this is a caveat because you don't wanna skip over the frozen section, which is also, um, it could be in the center aisles, depending on where you are. And lastly, if you were in my last talk, I talked about accountability. And I think this is incredibly important for grocery shopping as well. If you were just to say to someone else your plan, like you don't wanna spend more money than whatever, than whatever amount, or you wanna make sure that to eat the most healthy, if you could go with someone that keeps you accountable, this truly maximizes and increases the likelihood of you to essentially get what you really need and not just get everything that you think you want while you are at the store. In terms of preparation, you probably have heard this a million times about meal prepping. Uh, this is really important um, regarding using your time most efficiently whenever you do have to get to cooking. But once you're doing it, uh, one thing to consider is to double or triple batch. So basically, you have your recipe that uh, you found in Tasty or in whatever app or website or uh, magazine. And what you want to do many times in order for you to have more than you uh, need, really, is to double or triple batch it. That way, you are planning to have variety not only this week um, with um, this meal that you're preparing as an option, but you wanna have it available for the next two weeks. So you're gonna have this batch for this week in case you double batch it. And then you freeze the next batch, which is gonna be available for you, let's say in two to three weeks when you want it again, because let's say you already had it and you really like it. And you also might want to chop, peel, slice, roast, and do all these um, things that you might, the ways in which you are gonna to have to basically process your food in order for it to be available. Whatever you have to throw in the pan, if you need a chopped, I don't know, celery, then just chop it ahead of time, chop it in bulk so that that is available for you um, whenever you need it. If you're not gonna use it, you might wanna freeze it, you might wanna uh, vacuum seal it, et cetera, but it's really good to do this in bulk as well. So these are two truly important uh, components of meal prepping that I would suggest everyone to incorporate in their toolbox. And to the right, what we see is an illustration of what I truly think is the one of the best algorithms you can use for variety and nutrition, uh, which is a rotating menu. So you're gonna have the uh, tofu scramble, the shakshuka, the sesame peanut noodles. And um, you have this and one other option. And those are your core items for the week for your breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And what you do is you have two to three rotating items that you, you would like to switch. Um, for every two to three weeks. So you see a different recipe here and there. And what you do is you just substitute that rotating item uh, for whatever new recipe you found and you keep 
you keep using the variety, um, the variety component of the equation to not only maximize again and increase the likelihood of you meeting your variety and flavor needs, but also your nutritional needs. And I'm wrapping up basically most of um, what I've said to this point. So I just want to offer some takeaways for what it is that I suggest everyone do, uh, to do when it comes to building a budget friendly plan. Starting here to the left, again, planning and spending are part of the process. So you, you can't really get rid of this. The framing that you use to approach these problems is essential um, because you will feel more or, least or, or less at ease with how this process goes based on how you think about this problem. So no, you can't get rid of preparing or for planning, for chopping, for any of these things. You just have to know how to do them better. They're literally going to ride you all the way to your goal. You definitely want to determine what you need. You want to plan and prepare before going to the store. And while you're at the store, then when you're getting what you need, you want to double check what you have at home. You want to know what to expect when grocery shopping. And when preparing what you need, you want to maximize the time that you have allotted for meal prepping. So again, double and triple batching is a great uh, tool um, and making sure to switch things up, which um, a tool such as a rotating menu is a great idea, again, for maximizing the likelihood of meeting your nutritional needs, your variety needs, your uh, flavor needs, all of those needs that you have regarding um, food. And with that said, I just want to offer some resources for everyone regarding um, how to maximize uh, or how to best food, uh, how to store your food. The Academy of Nutrition Dietetics has some great resources, so I would suggest everyone to visit their website regarding uh, their, oops, storing food, uh, regarding eating affordably. There are many, many articles that are well-written. This is one that I, um, I really, really enjoyed reading. It's from Esther Ellis. She's an MS RDN, LDN, and here's the link for that. And I wanted to offer as well, um, in summary here, some of the apps that will make your life a lot simpler. These are some meal um, planners, and they help you to basically, obviously, as the name suggests, uh, plan uh, for meals. They are they have like automatic generators of meals depending on your needs. So you put in that you have this, for example, you are a vegetarian or you eat whatever this diet is, or you have no particular diet, but you would like to emphasize this component. They There are many apps that can um, help you to meet your goals. And these are some of them regarding the uh, grocery shopping apps. Um, almost every grocery store that I know of nowadays has an app. If not, most of them do. This is not the end all be all. You don't need an app in order to grocery shop properly, but they help a lot. And many times if they don't have an app, they have a website. So I would suggest checking whatever your local grocery shop is. Uh, for me, I, I guess, and for many of my friends is Walmart, Meyer, and Target. Um, so choose whichever fits best your needs. In terms of variety, I mentioned this too before. This is my two favorite, but there are many out there. If you literally just type recipe variety apps or, uh, I don't know, any, any, any alter, alternative of this, you will get options like Tasty or Fit Man Cook. And obviously there are apps even for integrating habits themselves. And for that one, I would offer Noom. Um, there are other options regarding um, getting food from different sources in case that um, you're a student, for example, and you would like for some resources, some place to go in order to get some food that is already available. They are dispensing them to, for example, students. I know that the sustainable student farm is an option, the pantry. Um, Bevere has some options as well here at the University of Illinois. So you might want to contact them if that is something that you're interested in. And with that said, um, I would want to, I wanted to encourage everyone to take the survey. Here you just have to scan this QR code uh, we would really appreciate the feedback here because it helps the speakers, uh, me include, me, myself included, to develop our skills. And also it gives us a way to see um, what you guys want to hear for future cinema, seminars. So there's that. And with that, I just wanted to encourage everyone to attend um, our next week. Uh, next week talk is going to be about um, nutrition labels. It's called um, Get the Facts on Nutrition Labels. Um, know Your Labels. It is going to be um, conducted by Layla Shin. She is, uh, she has a master's, she's an RDN. And this is going to be about um, learning about how to read nutrition facts, 
labels, as well as important information on vitamins and supplements that you can use in making healthy diet choices for you and for your family. And with that said, um, that is it. So great, Jonathan. I think, I think there was a question earlier that I want to make sure that you do answer. Um, it looked like it was from Steph and she asked about, let me do a picture. Um, what is fresh, what do you, what is fresh storage? I think she just wanted to kind of define what is fresh stored. Sure thing. Yeah. So I should have clarified that earlier, but fresh mm -hmm. stored in that uh, article specifically, they were talking about food that is stored in the fridge for five or more days. A lot of the literature has focused on what happens to food, not necessarily when it's, it's frozen immediately, but when you just let it sit on your fridge and if I'm going to actually go back really quick so I can make this visually more understandable um, here. So as you can see, uh, people wanted to, so ma many, many people have hypothesized that the quality and the quantity of nutrients in food does go down when you just store them in your fridge for say five days. So it's, there's a lapse in time between you buying them and you cooking them. And they wanted to see if five days would significantly decrease the nutrient on content of certain uh, important nutrients such as vitamin C, beta carotene folate, among others. And they notice a trend, a downward trend, not only with these three nutrients, but with other minerals, that there was uh, significantly less um, nutrients for very specific nutrients such as vitamin C on specific food items such as spinach. And there was a downward trend, as you can see. So it's lower here, slightly, slightly lower here, slightly lower here, slightly lower here. But there, it, there wasn't any significant difference. And once again, if you were to let your sit, your um, foot sit for five days, as you can see, it's not like, no, well, now you don't get any nutrients. It's just like it, their nutrient uh, content might decrease a bit, but it's not like they just, like their nutrient content disappears. So it's not the, it's not the end of the world. If you were to store them for five days, it's just something that you might want to consider. You might want to cook them close, like closer to when you buy them than not. Hopefully that answers the question. I think there's also another question about, um, how do you feel about fitness, my fitness pal app? I don't know if you're I, familiar with my fitness pal, but. Yeah, yeah, I, I am. Um, I didn't mention too many apps about tracking, for example, uh, outcomes related to uh, eating healthier, such as, you know, uh, apps like my fitness file, or I think it's my macros. Uh, and there, there are many, there are a, a lot of apps. And I do, do like my fitness file quite a bit. I know that it makes your life a lot easier with um, something like a few tools that they have in that app, such as scanning barcodes and other things such as such as that one. So I, I do like it a lot. And, and they do, from what I understand, they are incorporating this thing that stays verified. And uh, I, I'm unsure of what that means exactly, because for example, if you, if I were to know that my fitness file is putting that verified seal whenever an item, uh, uh, the content of an item in terms of the, its macronutrient and micronutrient content matches the USDA food database, then I would say that I, that is very reliable, but I'm unsure what that means exactly. So I do like it a lot. I think it's pretty good. And one of the main things that it, it might help people with is consistency and accountability. So I do encourage people to eat it uh, to eat it, sorry, to use it, um, if that is something that they feel that they need in terms of a, a tool. Wonderful. Thank you, Jonathan. Are there any other questions? Um, we can possibly unmute, um, but if you have a question that you'd like to ask in the chat, please feel free. I'm seeing that also Linda said, whole foods or plant-based contribute to a healthy way to maintain weight. Um, both can contribute to a healthy way to maintain weight. Yep. I'm not sure if that was a question, that was a question but uh, yes, they can both contribute to maintaining a healthy weight. Okay. Well, if there aren't any other questions, um, I just wanna thank everyone for their time today and thank you for coming. Um, thank you for participating and we hope to see you next week on our topic about get the facts on nutrition, know your labels. So 
all of you are free to go. Hopefully you were able to learn something new today. And, and thank you, Jonathan, for your expertise. Thank you.